What do you say we finish our window grill project? I think we have covered all of the necessary steps at some point in time or another from concept to full size layout to forging all of the components and getting everything ready to, to put in. We've made tools then we should have everything ready. We should be able to just go ahead and do this. Hopefully there's not some skill or technique I haven't covered but if so, you'll see a little bit of that today. Now, I've actually been working on this for a couple of hours already today, even though you probably won't be able to notice. What I've done is make sure that all of my balusters, or the vertical bars in the rail, are exactly the same length. So I've taken them all, compared them. The ones that were a hair too short, I have drawn out cold over the anvil. They weren't enough short that I needed to heat them just a sixteenth of an inch or so is all I needed to stretch them. So I did that cold at the anvil. The one bar that was too long, I upset back with a monkey tool. And I did that hot, and I did it just right at the very shoulder of the tenon. Just heated up a little bit of material, put a monkey tool on it, upset it, let it cool, compared it, made sure it was the right length. And if you need to do that two or three times, just take the time to do it however often it takes to get it just right. So all the bars are the same length. I have then calculated my tenon length. Now how do you calculate the tenon length? Here's a place where we need to go back and do a little bit of math. Our top and bottom rails are 5 eighths of an inch thick. We're using a 3 eighths tenon, or I am. Now if you're using something different, my calculations don't fit, but the basic premise is the same and that is for a round headed rivet which is the way we will do the heads on the tenons or the way I'm going to do the heads on the tenons is one and a half times the diameter of the tenon or of the rivet if you were actually using rivets. For a 3 8 rivet the easiest thing to do is to call that 6 sixteenths of an inch. And just don't double both numbers and then take half of the first number so half of six that's nine so you need nine sixteenths of an inch that's just one sixteenth over a half inch extra material besides this bar so for the five eighths bar and I wrote this stuff down so I don't have to try and do the math again while we're talking I needed one inch and three sixteenths worth of tenon to go through the bar and leave one and a half times my tenon diameter to make a head, a rivet style head on the other end. I hope that makes sense. These things are all pretty common formulas. Almost any book on blacksmithing is going to mention that. The other thing I did while we're talking about the tenons is I made sure they were all going to fit in my top and bottom rail really the pits to have one more tenon to go in and something doesn't fit because a hole is shrunk up or has a little burr. And to do that I just ran a drill bit through every single one of these holes and made sure everything fits. I have made sure my scrolls are identical enough that I'm happy with them. Now they may not be 100 percent perfect. They rarely are and that's part of the character of a hand forged piece like this but they are close enough that I am happy with them in this grill. The other thing I have done is make my collars. Uh, we talked about this the other day. A collar is measured around the material and we'll, we'll make another collar today just to refresh that. So if I was collaring this joint here, now this isn't exactly the way these bars will go together in the finished grill but for an example, this is quarter by half bar, two of them, so it's half by half, or half inch square. So if you go all the way around the perimeter of that bar, what you end up with is two inches. So you need two inches plus two and a half times the thickness of your collar material. I'm using eighth inch material, so that's three sixteenths of an inch, or excuse me, five sixteenths of an inch more material to make the, the bend. And that'll then go on here and we will bend these over. And we'll bend a collar in the vise when we need that particular collar. This one's already bent. But I counted up my collars. I need seven collars. 
I need two that will go in here, one here and one there, and that will hold both scrolls and the center bar together. So it's one collar in each spot, two of that size. This is where that little half inch square collar goes in, right here. So I'm going to need one that size. I have one, two, three, four places where these scrolls get collared to the top rail. So I need four of that size. And they happen to be the same length as these collars, but the bins are in different places because the, well, the total circumference is the same, the, the thickness is not the same, so it's a little bit different bend. Now when we had talked about this originally, I had thought about putting a little, the tenon all the way through the scroll here, but the scrolls don't really come out that that works very well and it was going to be problematic so it's better to put a collar over here and our scroll will fit just fine because right here at this point is where the collar will go and now it's let me see if I can do that so my arm's not in the way so that'll go there and the collar then will be right in here and this tenon will be out of the way so that's not going to be a problem at all so all of our pieces should fit. We know where they go. Quite frequently I would assemble this right on the drawing. I'd put the drawing up on the workbench and I'd work on the drawing. But that big piece of sheet metal is a little bit unruly and I'm going to do it on this smaller bench instead of going to the great big bench because this isn't that big a project. And I think it'll be easier to just do it on here. There's really only one way it can go together so the drawing doesn't make that much difference at this point. It's either going to go together or it's not. Now I would highly recommend a test fit before you get too serious about everything and make sure it's all going to go together the way you think it is. Pay attention to the fact that we only did two bars with twists. So they go evenly spaced and then the bars without the twists go in the end and the center. This can be a little bit fiddly. Sometimes it's nice to have help, but we can get it. And you could take a pipe clamp or something and clamp this up to hold it, but I don't know that we're going to need to. We will find out. Now at this point, you have a decision you can make. We could turn these bars so the diamonds face forward instead of flats forward. But I think I prefer them with the flats forward. But it's something you can experiment with. Turn the bar till the, the corner is up and see if you like that look better. This bar in the center, because it will have the scrolls on it though, will have to be flat. If you turn it diamond up, your scrolls and your collars are going to fit way different than what we've planned on. Now I've supported this up on a big block of steel so that my tenons aren't on the floor. And this way I can use this to, to hold the, the shoulder while I tenon the top end. And that will support this very nicely. I'll have to move that for just about every tenon. Although it looks like I might be able to do two at a time. And then on the top end, it's kind of leaning against this anvil, so it kind of helps hold it. But then I have it clamped to a work stand. I've just adjusted the work stand right up under it, clamped it. The stress from hammering is going to that block on the floor, not to the work stand. It's just there so it doesn't fall over, and I don't need an extra set of hands. Well, it looks like once again I managed to let the battery go dead on the little microphone I wear. So I will try to narrate this after the fact. 
I'm using a torch to heat the tenon ends. I think this is the easiest way to do this. You can get the piece clamped up and secured. It's easy to work on. You bring the heat to the piece instead of trying to wrestle the grill with the ends of the tenons in a forge fire. I'm sure it would be possible to do that if you really had to. The other thing you could do is make your tenons a little bit smaller. A quarter inch tenon you could probably do cold if you had had no way to heat it. Also a pneumatic rivet gun would be a good way to go, but I don't have a pneumatic rivet gun. I also don't have a 3 8 rivet header, so I'm just doing these by hand and by eye. I think they will look fine. They'll be a bit more organic that way, but I think it goes along with the style of the grill, so I'm just fine with that. If you need a perfect round head rivet, take the time to make a rivet header. And that's obviously a video we will need to do in the near future. This takes several heats to get these to sit down nicely. You'll notice that every now and then I use a crescent wrench to straighten the bar. They tend to want to twist as you hammer the rivet until they start to get tight. Once the heads are tight or once you have one end done, they really don't twist too bad. But the initial hammering of the rivet head, they can kind of spin around. So keep an eye on it. Keep them under control. I also at some point in time during this took a few minutes and I went and drilled a hole in that big block I've got on the floor so that the lower tenon fits in that hole and it provides better support and doesn't slide around so much. It's a much better system. There are lots of ways you can secure these things. This is just one option. I've seen various bucking bars and clamps to do it all horizontally on the up on the layout table. It's just whatever you have and whatever works best for you I think is just fine. It's just a matter of getting it done and making sure that everything goes together right. If you get one of these tenons messed up and the shoulder doesn't seat, it's real hard to fix. So I think we're about to have sound again, so we'll go back to the sound. I went ahead and did all the bottom ones and that's the last of the top ones. This riveting over the tenons looks the same on every single one of them. So you probably didn't need to watch that ten times. But if you want to go back and rewind it to the first one and watch the first one ten times, yeah, go ahead. Now this is the major assembly of this grill done. And this is a completely functional grill at this point. You could hang this on the side of the house or cover your window and it's going to do exactly what the grill needs to do. The only reason we are adding scrolls to this is because our original sample grill, the tacky wrought iron that has no wrought iron in it grill, had scrolls in it and we're just showing essentially the same thing but done 100% forged as a blacksmith would do it and not cold bent and fabricated and welded and all that. So this is really a hallmark of these kind of cheesy grills, the scrolls, and to be perfectly honest I don't really like the scrolls in this project. I would probably not put them on except that we are being inspired by this grill and I'm going to finish it in this style. But really if you don't like the scrolls, don't do the scrolls. I think scrolls look really good in a lot of things, but in this they're just kind of stuck on there because that's what makes it look like wrought iron in some people's minds. And one of the things that you can tell it's probably not real wrought iron is scrolls just tacked on where they otherwise probably don't belong. But we're still going to do a much better job than welding these with an arc welder. I mean, these things have splatters way up in here and over here and everything from welding. Really a bad job. 
So to do our scrolls, I'm going to flip this upside down. And this is going to be the bottom of the grill, so I'm going to leave that towards the camera. All of our scrolls should be flush with the front of the grill. If there's any variation, you want that to be to the back. And I'm going to look at the original to see how these went. Here's the proper position for these scrolls. And these scrolls are going to go on this way. Now I think I would rather do these because they, they seem less vulnerable to me than these two will. So I'm going to do them first and then we'll slide this up and support these two on the workbench to do them. This is another place where you can look at your scrolls though. Do you like these somewhere else? Would you rather have a matching set top and bottom and none in the middle? It's worth taking the time to check. So from my bottom rail, I got 10 inches there, 9 and a half there, so I'm going to move them just a little closer. Okay, that's where I'm going to put these. And of course I don't have a clamp that wants to fit in there properly, so we're going to do it without. Now we have to find our two collars that are this size. They're the ones with the one inch spread. One will go there and one will go up here. And so I know where these go. I'm just going to mark across all three where it will be covered by the collar, so it doesn't matter if you've got a pencil mark on there. And some of this is still hot. It certainly doesn't hurt to allow this to cool down. And these collars are tight enough I'm going to have to hammer some of this together I think. It's just fine by me. worth looking at that and make sure you like the way it came out. Now this is a place that I really do wish my clamp fit. I'm going to see if I've got a pair of tongs I can use instead of a clamp there. So that should work. It pays to drive that down just before you set them. So I'm going to go ahead and set this one first. I'm going to use the torch to heat these just down from the end. I don't want to heat this top section too much or I'll just bow it over. I want a good crisp bend and I want to stretch that collar a little bit as I bend it. One collar.
working that one from the wrong direction. Better fix that. Got to do the one that will have the bevel side up first so the other one overlaps properly. And this collar is just backwards from the first one, which makes no difference in the long run, but you got to pay attention to that stuff when you put it together. I do miss my little uh, economizer valve I usually use with the torch. I'm going to have to get one for the propane. closes up very nicely. So now that shouldn't want to go anywhere. So those collars are good and solid. I can now slide this up and it's still on the bench where it's supported but now I have room to work on these other two scrolls. And I think the first thing I'm going to do with these is go ahead and assemble this center so they want to be a single unit. So I have a little collar just made for this particular spot. We're going to put that down in there and I'm going to use this top rail to make sure everything is going to fit the way it's supposed to because if you get this collar off, these ends are going to stick out in some funny direction. So you want to make sure you've got this collar in the right place. I know that looks like it's in the wrong place, but it's not attached. Make sure the collar is good. And you don't want to work too much after you seat that collar, because you'll actually be drawing the bars out, and then the collar is going to end up being too big. Okay, so there's that. My next trick is going to be to put these collars on, and we're going to, going to make one more collar as we do this. Now these collars I actually managed to bend a little off, but that's actually okay because that'll put my bend, my end, centered on the 5 8 bar instead of somewhere close to the seam. So I'm actually kind of happy that I ended up messing that up. Yeah, remember, some of this stuff is hot. You need to let things cool between steps. Let it cool. I think the most important thing here is that this is centered on here. If your tails are a little bit off one way or the other, that probably won't show as much as if this is not centered. So we're ready to bend that collar, but we do have a decision to make here. Our scrolls are quarter by half. This is five eighths. So we have an extra eighth inch here. I can either shim the scrolls up and try to center them on the bar, or I can leave them all the way forward and tight to the bench. 
which would be the easiest way to go. And I think that's what I'm going to do because I think I will like that better with everything to the front. But you could center them, in which case you shim this, and you just let the collar pretend it's all 5 8 material. Because trying to make that little offset the collar would be really a nuisance. Try to bend this long tab that's not fully supported by the quarter inch. Try to bend it over square. Again, I managed to grind my ends opposite here. And the collar just doesn't care. It might be good for your peace of mind to do them all the same. So you don't have to think about every one as a separate thing. But it doesn't hurt anything. Okay, we're one collar short of a window grill, and I have that piece cut. Now we're going across a piece that's 5 eighths plus a quarter, so that's 7 eighths of an inch by 5 eighths. So total that up all the way around, so you get all four sides, and add two and a half times the thickness of your collar material. You go back and watch the collaring video if you don't understand what I'm talking about. I think it's explained better there. Well, once again, I uh, seem to have forgotten to turn the microphone on. We're going to take our other collar. We've marked the center mark, and we know that this is 7 eighths from the top to the bottom here. So we want to offset this 7 sixteenths from the center mark and clamp it in the vise. We'll put that offset line right at the top jaw of the vise, and bend it over 90 degrees. Because the top of the vise slopes, I can put it in the end of the vise here, and that's exactly 90, and that makes a much nicer bend. And I'm going to use a 7 8 spacer block. I did not have any 7 8 material in the 
chop. So I had to forge something larger down to size and make it exactly 7 eighths. And because that wasn't perfectly square after I forged it, I ground or filed this to fit exactly. So take the time to make the spacer block fit what you need and then your collars will fit better. Just going to clean this up in the, the top of the block there. Make that as good as we can. And that's a, the last collar ready to go. Get it all set in place. Now this collar seems to have sprung open a little bit and doesn't seat quite as well as I would like it to. So we're going to deal with that as a separate issue before we actually wrap the collar. I'm going to take the torch and heat the lower portion of the collar and make sure it really seats to the front of the grill properly before I start wrapping it and then I'll give it a good squeeze with the tongs to make sure everything fits right. So we're just heating the lower lower portion. It doesn't have to be a real high heat, just hot. It may not even be hot enough for you to quite see by the time I'm done, but it was a hot enough to be a dull red in the shop lighting. Then I'll just take the hammer and set this down real quick. Make sure it's down tight. And get in there with the tongs and squeeze it together. And now that fits as well as all the other collars did so we can go on and heat the ears up and, and bend it over. And then we'll be able to do the other side just like that. And here I realize that I forgot to turn the microphone on. So we'll have normal sound again. Thanks for bearing with me. Come nobody told me I didn't have any sound on. You can tell this is an amateur production. So here is our completed window grill project. ready for whatever finish you choose to put on it. I may just let this one rust because it's not something that I'm all that serious about anyways. It was a demonstration piece and was done just for the sake of the videos. But it will fit the window on my shed. So I'll probably put it on there but I probably won't worry about it. In the Colorado climate, even though it will be rusty, it will still be solid and secure long after I am gone. So that's not that big a deal. So I hope if you were following along you enjoyed this project. Okay, see, there's the, the grill we just did. And this is the grill that spurred it all on. I found this on eBay and thought that would be a good project just to show how a blacksmith would make a grill like this instead of how a modern wrought iron shop makes it. I won't even say a fabricator because fabricators do fantastic work and I'm not trying to talk bad about fabricators. You can fabricate things that are spectacular. But this kind of tacky stuff that people call wrought iron is sort of insulting to blacksmiths and if this is what you make, I'm sorry I feel that way, it's just the way it is. We're not going to argue about it, you can feel differently if you'd like. But you can see the scrolls that are just cut off sharp. In fact, there's still a burr on there that hadn't been removed. And it's been kinked here and been around versus our scrolls that have been tapered and are smooth to the touch and aren't kinked. They are scrolled nicely around. This is welded on here. We've used some hot collars, which is a very nice detail. 
These bars were twisted, but they were twisted cold, just locked in a vise and grabbed with a crescent wrench, probably. And our bars are twisted hot. We have a chis chisel line running down them to make a nice twist. These are welded and have big splattery, blobby welds all over the, the edges here. And ours are put together with mortise and tenon joints. There's a lot of blacksmithing skill involved in this grill project. So, while well, that other thing is called wrought iron, I would call this decorative iron or ornamental iron because steel is still 99 point something percent iron. It is mostly iron. But there's no wrought iron in this. The material wrought iron is no longer made and available today unless you do your own smelt like we did a while back. So I don't like calling this wrought iron. Now, I'll step off of that soapbox for a minute and accept the fact that the rest of the world, other than blacksmiths, think of this type of work as wrought iron work. So if you're trying to sell it, you probably have to use that term. If you're trying to market it or you've got a, a website and you want people to find your work and they're searching for wrought iron, you're going to have to call your work wrought iron or they will never find you. So it's a term that isn't going away. It's a term we're stuck with. I believe it is incorrect. I don't believe that's what we should be calling it. But it's either if you can't beat them, join them, or let somebody else have that business that's doing the other kind of work. And if you're doing better work, you're not going to get the business. So if you're doing better work, you might still have to call this wrought iron. I'm going to try to avoid it because really this isn't what I do for a living. I make tools and hardware and things like that. And sometimes I have to call my hinges wrought iron, but a grill like this, this was done purely for the exercise. It was a challenge that one of you viewers put me to, to some extent, because somebody said, We'd, I'd like to see you do some of the things that you find more difficult. And because I don't do this kind of work all the time, this is a little bit more difficult. I understand how to do it. I've done it before. But it's not what I do day in and day out. So this does provide a challenge. And it does improve my skills as a blacksmith to challenge myself and make something like this. So to whoever that viewer was, thank you for throwing that challenge out there. You probably didn't even know you were doing it, but I try to uh, go a little, little further. And when people comment on something, if it sounds like it'd be a good video, I try to go there and work that in. And there's a lot of those good videos that are still out there waiting to happen. So anyways, I think I've talked about this project long enough. Again, if you make welded wrought iron, I'm not really trying to insult you. It's just not my taste, and I don't think it has anything to do with blacksmithing. And as a blacksmith, I'm always going to try and go for the hand forged product with forged traditional joinery instead of welded joinery, because that's what I'm in blacksmithing for. I'm not blacksmithing to find ways to shortcut what the past masters did. I'm trying to learn from the past masters and learn to do as much as I can with traditional work. And that's what we've done here. So I hope you found that interesting. I hope it was valuable. I think we probably started this project back in October. It is now April. So what has that been? Uh, six months or something that it took to complete this project. And that's okay. Do a little here, a little there. It didn't need to be done fast. We've got a lot of good videos. We made a lot of tools that we used to work on this. And we'll probably do something else like this again in the future. Maybe a small garden gate. Maybe a handrail for my stairs in the house or something like that. But we will do some more of this kind of stuff. I hope you enjoyed the video. Hope you can give it a thumbs up. Love it if you'd hit that subscribe button. Feel free to share all my videos with your friends if you'd like to. Watch a few more of them. If you enjoy them and would like to help out financially, there is a link down in the description to Patreon and PayPal, and you can donate that way. There is no obligation. The content is free. I have no intent on going to a paid system. But the donations do help fund the cost of materials to do projects like this. In the meantime, do make time to get out to your shop. Challenge yourself. Do something that isn't what you do every day. Experience something different. Gain new skills. Make new tools. But stay safe. 
wear your safety glasses, and we'll see you for the next one.